Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. And I'm pleased to be joined today again by Gary Kasparov, the great world chess champion, democracy activist, author of several books, including the one we spent a conversation discussing, I yes. think, when it came out, what, three years ago? Yeah, almost three years ago. Winter is coming. So that was on the state of the world. And has winter come? What ha Are you more cheerful, less cheerful? What, what was the, the subtitle of that the book? The subtitle, was, Why Vladimir Putin and the Enemies of the Free World Must Be Stopped. So, and I think it's quite a timely uh, um, conversation. So how's that going? Uh, how's the free world doing against the enemies of the free world? So um, when the book was released in October 2015, there were many good, good positive reviews, raving even reviews, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Weekly Standard, uh, The Economist, Financial Times, the London Times. Of course, there was the um, mm, trashing review from New York Times based on a character issue. So trying to present the book, that the book was all about Obama bashing, though the book was highly critical about uh, uh, Bush 43, about Clinton, and about the overall policy after, after um, Cold War. Uh, and uh, my criticism was based on the fact that since 1991, America failed to come up with a long-term strategy. And I think this is one of the most important and, and very often overlooked uh, uh, element of this construction. Dictators are very good in, in being reactive. So this is they, they are opportunists, tacticians. While democracies must rely on long-term strategy, it's about laying down the strategy for years to come, not necessarily to benefit uh, the office holder now. And as, for instance, uh, um, in, in mid-40s, in, in 1946, Truman administration right. set up policies and also built institutions like National Security Council, CIA, NATO, Marshall Plan, uh, Voice of America was turned into the, the, the uh, counter-propaganda uh, um, tool. Uh, and it worked 40 years later with a Republican president, Ronald Reagan, so delivering the final deadly blow to communism. Since uh, early 90s, we could see that American foreign policy worked more like a pendulum, swinging from one side to another, and it was all about president. So Clinton is there doing little, uh, uh, George W. Bush uh, are doing too much, as many say, so though I, I would not agree with such you know, a harsh assessment. Obama doing absolutely nothing. And uh, um, it created uh, an impression in the outside world that America can no longer be a reliable leader. Because if everything depends on, on, on the office holder today, so how can you expect America just to, uh, to lead the world, the free world, especially at the time where we could see the rise of dictators uh, all over? So let's talk about that. So three years later, the, I'm afraid dictators are stronger in the West and the free world is a little weaker, no? Uh, maybe today we, we see some hope because I think the, the free world now is, is, is about to recognize the threat. So um, just recently, we could see that G7 uh, um, foreign ministers agreed to create a special group to study malicious behavior of Russia, including meddling in the elections, not only in America, but also in Europe, uh, interference with the political process, um, um, uh, attempts to assassinate uh, and, and sometimes assassinations uh, yeah. of, of um, uh, enemies of the regime uh, uh, outside outside of, of of Russia, and of course uh, fake news industry and wars, just you know, an annexation of Crimea, war in in East Ukraine, and and uh, uh, genocide in Syria. Um, it's a good move, as few others made by uh, American administration and, and European allies. But it's, it's late. It's just what, what bothers me that certain moves are being made, but they're always behind. Yeah. So, for instance, the, the same limited strike against Syrian targets in 2013, as Trump did uh, some time ago, could have dramatic effect. And I believe would have prevented Assad uh, from moving forward and using chemicals again. And Putin, I cannot guarantee, but most likely would not enter Syria. But today, as, as we predicted, and as we learned from history books, the price went up. Yeah. Any delay by responding to aggression of a dictator, any delay in, in, uh, in recognizing the threat, so emboldens dictators, especially at a time today when unlike 75 years ago or even 25 years ago in just Clinton's days when we, uh, um, the world did nothing to stop genocide in Rwanda, we know about it. 
it's not that we can claim our ignorance. We never heard about it. We, we were doing something else. It was not on television. Today, most of, the, of these brutal acts, of these genocides, you know, they are they, their own life. So, and since we cannot claim our innocence by not knowing about it, we, by doing nothing, we are emboldening dictators. Because for them, it's basically, oh, it's a green light. You knew. You did nothing. So why not to move forward? And for those who say, yeah, Assad is now paying price for using chemical weapons. I mean, come on, Assad used chemical weapons and he won. When he first time used chemicals in 2013, he was just, uh, um, just in, almost in his, politically in his deathbed. Yeah. He was just, you know. Everyone was discussing how long he would last. Yeah, exactly. Right? Just, the only debate was, you know, just could he escape, you know? Right. Would he follow, you know, just the, uh, the footstep of Gaddafi or Saddam or maybe someone will offer him political asylum, maybe right. he'll end up in Moscow or elsewhere or in Iran. Now he's winning. When you look at the Syrian map, I don't think it will last, but it, uh, there's some pockets of resistance. But basically, he succeeded in eliminating some strongholds of opposition by using chemical weapons. Why he did it? Because they knew they didn't have enough um, mm, uh, manpower to enter the cities and to have the street fights. They used chemicals. But also, I think your point, which you sort of just you should develop, is. I mean, they get stronger if they do something that's outrageous and everyone gets upset and then nothing ultimately happens. At the end of that cycle, they're stronger and not weaker because the outrage turned out to be yeah, but, but also, in, yes. impotent, yeah, right? But I mean, exactly. dictators benefit from but it. But also, it also shows the, the not just limitations, but total uh, uh, um, uh, usefulness of, of uh, um, institutions like United Nations. Yeah, well. the, the, it's, they, they outlive their importance and... Uh, in my book, Winter is Coming, I've been addressing this fact that after 1991, the world needed sort of a new, a new structure. As um, uh, uh, Senator McCain said, it's leak of democracies. Right. We had to force uh, other countries, uh, non-democratic countries, uh, to move in this direction and stop paying lip services, but to get, to get serious about respecting human rights and so international treaties. Contrary to, 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 the, to, the, to, to those, to, to, the, this, to these uh, predictions, to these claims that by doing nothing, by sticking to, to United Nations uh, structures, we, um, uh, um, that, that would, would um, freeze the situation and will not, will not offer solutions. So the Western powers decided that you know, it's, um, it will be politically um, um, costly to uh, enforce any reforms, and uh, it was all business as usual. As a result, Russia used, I don't know how many times, veto only on Syria, basically blocking. And now they're trying to find sort of the, the legalistic ways of just going around. I mean, come on, United Nations is, is, is a catwalk for dictators. So every General Assembly in New York, you know, a part of the fact that it paralyzes the traffic in the city. It's terrible. Yeah, right? Exactly, which is terrible. <laughs> but it's, it offers unique opportunity for dictators just to, to, to come from all the quarters in the world and to spend hours at, at the UN uh, uh, um, stage bragging about their accomplishments. So it seems to me that you know, they, they, in, in the last 25 years or so, since the end of the Cold War, dictators, all authoritarian leaders around the world, they, they're supporting, who, who we know for supporting terrorism and, and, uh, and uh, all the destructive actions, uh, they learn how to use democratic institutions to their advantage. Not only political, but also financial institutions, the business structures, the social fabric of, of, the, of the free world. And as the elections in 2016 showed in, in, in America, so the free world was totally unprepared to this kind of hybrid war. But don't you think, uh, it just seems to me things are, as you said, it's harder to intervene now in Syria than it would have been five yep. years ago or seven years ago. And the same is true in general in terms of standing up to dictators, regaining momentum, stopping erosion elsewhere in the world. So, and, but it's not as if people, maybe there's a little evidence in the G7 of some people waking up, but you really wouldn't look around the world and say that there's a huge reaction here and a huge willingness to do what we need to do. So I guess for me, it, I, it's, it's very worrying. The disconnect between what the reality out there, which is not good and it's getting worse, and public sentiment and elite sentiment here in the US and elsewhere is pretty, Stark, pretty shocking, don't you think? I mean, uh, again, uh, I think this is it's, it's the trend is is, is changing slowly. Okay, right. Yeah, it's the I think it's this hope we we will hit the bottom, uh, but we should recognize that the price uh, that we we have to pay to stop dictators and actually to to turn the tide, um, and at the end of the day, it, it 
whether we like it or not, it's not a diplomatic language, it's not politically correct. But in many cases, the only solution is regime change. I know so many people will jump in their chairs, now oh, how can you talk about it? This is the only solution. You can talk about, about uh, diplomatic solutions and about uh, having endless negoci negotiations, but unless you change the regime, unless you have countries like Russia, Iran, North Korea, having different kind of governments, it's, it will be a source of a problem forever. It's the, the temporary solutions, they only benefit dictators. Again, they're tacticians. Strategy should, be, should aim at a changing, a changing regimes. You don't have to use this rhetorics, but you definitely have to look for every opportunity to strengthen forces within, the, within these countries or outside uh, to um, create conditions where these regimes that are vulnerable, these yeah. regimes are vulnerable. The strengths of, the, um, of these regimes is, is, is a direct result of our weakness. They benefit from us being weak. It's not that we don't have economic or military uh, uh, or political power to go after them. We don't have political will. Right. And that brings us back to, to, um, to the situation you know, within, the, within our society. It's not just politicians that are, that are not willing to take actions. It's, it's a general public. The public is not, um, is not ready right. to, to um, support those who can stand, take a stand as Ronald Reagan and just to point at Korea, North Korea or Russia saying the evil empire. Uh, public is, is lazy, complacent. Uh, public lo loves the language of appeasement because it's a good language. The moment you talk about deterrence, it's... Uh, and, Nobody wants to pay any cost. We want benefits, but we don't want to pay for that. So, do you, but <laughs> what do we do? So, that's a little depressing. That's a little worrisome. Yeah. And it does seem to be, I mean, couldn't things get worse? What, what, I guess what worries me the most is that it's already 500,000 dead in Syria. Putin already getting away with things, and now Eastern Europe is going in a backward direction. China flexing its muscles and us foolishly pulling out of trade deals and so forth. And you look around the world and you think, you know, Syria, Assad, who was, uh, on his, was supposed to be out of power five years ago, you know, the next moment, now uh, uh, flexing his, you know, using chemical weapons, Russia's in there. We kicked Russia out of the Middle East, what, 30, 40 years ago, and now they're back. I mean, how much, it could get worse. I mean, that's, I guess, what worries me the most. I mean, three years from now, we could be having this conversation. I mean, what, what worries you, I guess I put this, what worries you the most? We can't do everything at once. I mean, no, what, is it Putin? It's is the, it, no, it's uh, the, um, no, what worries me is that's, 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 even, even being uncured optimist by nature, and I could see some positive signs of the free world waking up, uh, it's, that's what I learned from history. Uh, by doing nothing, we embolden dictators. We let them move much further than they, 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 they could w with us being proactive five or seven years ago, which means we will have to confront them from a much weaker position. And again, it means we will have to contribute more forces uh, politically, most likely militarily, to stop them and just to push them back. That means in many cases we can see wars. Um, Middle East is, it's for those who think, oh yeah, maybe we have to remove American troops and, and we can see here there's, you know, the, 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 the Trumpists and the far left. They are just, you know, both arguing that's uh, for removal of American troops and that will solve all the problems. Yes, America can walk away from the Middle East. Israel cannot. It just, this is called geography, it's there. Right. And, uh, and then for those who are just arguing for America being the, the, the only source of a problem, ignoring uh, um, Assad's uh, war crimes and Putin supporting this genocide and Iranian terrorism there, uh, and in general, the Sunni Shia schism and, and wars that lasted what, for more than a thousand years. So, I mean, for those who can tell, fine. Imagine you now America is out and Iran will stop short of attacking Israel while they already build a bridge from Tehran to the Israeli borders, to Golan Heights. No, there will be a war. And you understand that Israel will, you know, will defend itself vigorously. It will not uh, be leading from behind. It will use all the weapons. And we know what Israel has in its, in its arsenals. So it's, it's, not, it's not about us retreating. Basically, retreat of the free world makes war more likely, 
And this is a lesson we had to learn from the Sudis. And when I read books about the Sudis and about the rise of Nazis and, and the threats from Japan, Imperial Japan and from Stalin, it, I have certain sympathy for Chamberlain and other politicians um, from, uh, from Lord Halifax, you now just, just following this movie, The Darkest Hour, right. because they, they didn't know what, what was coming. They didn't have books to read. And they had genuine concerns about the war and they looked for every option to avoid to avoid the war, even by, by offering concessions to Hitler uh, um, uh, or eventually to Stalin. Uh, but today we don't have this excuse. No, and also they had the excuse, which is a real excuse, I think, uh, not ultimately a real, yeah. I mean, not ultimately a, a legitimate excuse, but a understandable excuse of World War I. I mean, think oh, about it. They're only, they're less than 20 years away in the mid to late 30s. Yeah from, you know, an unbelievably devastating oh, it's, yeah. conflict. It, and so you can see that they think, oh my God, we stumbled into this war, we didn't realize what we were doing quite, we thought we were doing the right thing, and we ended up, you know, in a way, to, you know, a huge setback to Western civilization. We have no such excuse, right? I mean, no, no, we, no, I mean, absolutely. That's, that's where no, I think, we, we don't that's have, even more depressing, that we don't even have a good reason for our passivity, really. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's something in our nature. I, I, um, I've been trying just to, to, to fantasize about the alternative history, just going back to 1938, just imagine it was not Chamberlain, but uh, uh, the Prime Minister of, of um, uh, British Commonwealth, uh, um, but Winston Churchill. Of course, he would not have, uh, would not have accepted uh, Hitler's demands. Like, likely, Hitler could attack Czechoslovakia, uh, England, and who knows, yeah. France, maybe joining the war. And it could end, I think it would end up uh, uh, mm, mm, in, I don't know, in a year or so, uh, with Germany being defeated, maybe generals rising as Hitler, but hundreds of thousands dead, destruction across Europe, another war, uh, and 25 years later, you have historians writing about warmongering Churchill, totally. forcing Europe into a war, yeah. and if we were so lucky having the peace-loving Chamberlain, so we could have avoided this. Right. So, unfortunately, this, it's, 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 an, it's in a repeated cycle, but now we know that's this is this hypothetical hypotheticals didn't didn't happen uh, uh, just because we learned you know the hardest lessons possible, and still we are just you know we are inviting dictators to move forward because dictators never ask why it's always why not, and to kick now Putin out of Syria and just to restore peace, even fragile peace in the Middle East will require uh, serious uh, um, uh, sacrifices and uh, uh, expecting that it will just it will be so resolved on its own without us paying the, the huge price. I think it's, it's quite stupid. And also, it's how people, how realistically, you know, just it's, people can expect America uh, being um, uh, geographically far away from the from, from Middle East and still rely on two oceans to defend America. Yeah. In, on 9-11, 19 terrorists killed more Americans than the entire Japanese fleet mm. at Pearl Harbor 60 years earlier. So it's just, and, and today, of course, the, the opportunities for bad guys to cause harm to this country or to, to our European allies is just, they, they are just uh, uh, virtually limited. And having Putin behind them, just using this old KGB machine and, uh, and other terrorists and, 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 and thugs around the world who could see direct benefits from attacking America, defying America. Um, and of course, having China that just is doing nothing of that kind, but benefiting from America being weak and just you know, uh, building its economic muscles and also military muscles gradually you know, just taking over uh, uh, small islands here and there. So it's, it's China is more like an encroachment. Uh, but you could see that the map has been changing, and you hear from this administration or from European allies still more more calls for talks. You know, how can we find you know the common ground? There is no common ground with people who do not share our values. Period, because it's the the free world succeeded because we we all had the same values. We we could have differences between America and France or uh, uh, England or Germany after a World War II, but the values were the same. So we, we, we relied on, on a free market, on rule of law, on democracy, on free and fair elections. And looking at others, you know, we should recognize that it's, it could be a temporary solution. But the temporary solution only, it lasts only as long as we are strong. And if we show any sign of weakness, they will go after us because that's, that's the way they can gain they political capital. 
Undemocratic regimes, they need confrontation to justify their existence, especially if we're dealing with countries like Russia or North Korea, when you have one dear leader, leader who just who, who must uh, project strengths, and he cannot afford even, even uh, the slightest, uh, slightest moment of hesitations and, and vulnerability. How vulnerable do you think they are? I mean, that would be the other side of it, since people like me, I mean, sort of when Reagan said we can bring down the Soviet Union, we thought, oof, you know, if we can contain it and deter it and gradually make progress uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, that'd be great. And Reagan seemed like a, a crazy optimist when he said it's actually weaker than it looks. Do you think that's also true, though, that if we reverse policy in the West, that these, some of these dictatorships are actually not as fearsome as they look when they're on the march and when we're weak? Uh, the answer is yes. They are not as strong as they look or as they pretend uh, to be because they know how to use all the fake news and the propaganda, ironically, how to use technology invented and developed in the free world to undermine the very foundation of the free world. So they learn how to do that. It's, they, they now are operating within the framework of so-called hybrid wars because they know they're weak. Russia today, Russia under Putin, is a pale shadow of Soviet Union under Stalin or even under Brezhnev, militarily and economically. But the problem is the, the free world is also a pale shadow right. uh, of, of, uh, of, the, um, of the free world under um, uh, administration during the Truman's administration or uh, Reagan's days. Um, I think the end of the Cold War played a trick on the psychology of, of people in America or in Europe. And I understand this as kind of relief. For so many years, we, we, have, we, we, we lived under this fear of nuclear destruction. And all of a sudden now, we don't have to, uh, to, uh, to be afraid of, uh, of the attack from the Soviet Union. And moreover, we can actually turn these great inventions uh, of the era of the space race and nuclear race into commercial products. Um, it's a consumer paradise. So what about us making not just peace, but just embracing our, our enemies? Let's bring them in. And if we just you know, negotiate with them, we open trade, we, we give them all the concessions, they'll change. Uh -uh. It's, this is the, the, the whole concept has been refuted uh, um, decisively over the last 25 years. If you open these this lines of communication, and if you impose no demands for the other side, for non-democratic countries to, to enter this field um, and just to, to act as equal partners. It's not that they will change their behavior. It's not that they will turn to be democratic. They will see an opportunity to corrupt you, corrupt our world. That's what happened. They use all these channels to corrupt political elite, the business structures. And now we can look at, at, at the desperate actions of British government. They just realized they, they, they have Russian uh, um, Called, called investment all over the place. You're talking about what, 500 billion pounds? I mean, insane amount. And how are you going to deal with that? So you can, most of this money is, 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 is a shadow money, is, is a criminal money, it's a money laundering. But simply to take it away from the economy, this could have dramatic consequences. So it's less um, um, uh, scary here in this country but still, we have a lot of Russian money, a lot of influence, uh, and it, because money buys influence, and uh, influence buys politicians, and we could see that. That's the, there's so many voices now from high political quarters arguing that yeah, we need um, more um, um, uh, reserve, uh, uh, prudent um, right, right. Um, uh, treatment, just, just again, Let's slow down. Let's not make some drastic moves. Uh, and that's, that's what Putin needs. You know, I, I suppose we shouldn't be too nostalgic either about the 70s and 80s. I mean, the Cold War had its ups and downs. And I remember, I think Pierre Hasner wrote this, the French thinker maybe, uh, who's actually still alive, not, uh, I think, ailing. But um, this is maybe right after the end of the Cold War. And he, so, you know, the West is proud of winning, as it should be. Uh, Reagan and Thatcher and others showed strength. But in a way, he says, it was a kind of comparative decadence. That the West was somewhat decadent, but luckily the Soviet Union was rotting much faster from within. And when we had a moment of standing up under Reagan, it was enough to bring down that edifice. But he was sort of warning against a kind of excessive patting ourselves on the back but, over that. And I do worry that, you know, over the last 25 years, sort of the things he was worried about 
uh, you know, we have progressed further. But it's, that's also, going back to the, to the Cold War, and it's what I wrote about this period in my book, uh, we should, uh, as a professional chess player, argue that uh, you have to analyze the game, even if you won the game. Yes. You must go back and analyze it because it's not that you, you, you had the best game ever played. It's not clean from from the first to the last move. It's about you making mistakes, your opponent making mistakes, but, but you have to understand what was the reason of you winning. And uh, the Cold War, uh, just from my perspective, it's now not as a professional chess player, but somebody who was born and raised in, in, in the Soviet Union and could see, could see the, uh, the Cold War um, from the other side of Iron Curtain. Um, I believe the... Uh, the main advantage that that led to a decisive victory in the Cold War for the free world was not just technology, the military power, but it was it was all about values. So people on the other side they just recognized that uh, the communist ideology was an empty shell. It offered nothing to people. Right. So the free world could attract millions, tens of millions, or hundreds of millions of people by the ideas that they could be free. They could decide for themselves. Power of ideas, was, that's, that was the main weapon. And that's what probably Reagan realized, that is, that's, yeah. it was the right time to actually to, to, to push further because we reached a point where communist regime uh, based on, on forced labor um, couldn't compete with the free world in, in creating new technologies. So that was a moment for the, for the final push. Now it seems that we, you know, we are, uh, on, 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 because now I'm speaking from the other side. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. we don't have technically the same iron curtain, but the world is 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 divided. And the problem is this division is not geographical. It's not like Berlin divided by 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 the wall. It's not Eastern Europe, Western Europe. This division is very often just just among ourselves. And um, we tempted to um, offer this kind of moral equivalence. Yes, yes, this were all wrong, so we also made mistakes. Yes, but uh, the Putin did that. But remember in Vietnam, Americans did. Well, Trump, yeah. right? Trump, yeah, but, we, we, but exactly. we have killers but, too. But, right? but exactly. Yeah. And that's the, that's the that's an essence of fake news. That's an essence of, of Putin's propaganda machine because he's no longer selling you one right ideology. It's not like he's preaching communism or any other ideology. He's, he, he's selling chaos. I call him merchant of doubts. Uh, maybe we're lying. Everybody's lying. So this truth is unknown. You can you cannot find the truth because there's so many versions of that, and uh, and that's what brings the brings the free, the free world down because that gives a huge advantage to to the other side that doesn't care about the rule of law, just about uh, uh, international treaties. Yes, we did that, but you know somebody else did that. Oh, Crimea, but Kosovo. So. We, we, we keep failing to, to impose the rules and regulations uh, that you know, helped us to prevail uh, during the during, um, Cold War, and we are voluntarily um, sacrificing our biggest advantage, uh, our adherence to the values of the free world that, by the way, helped to build global e economy, the, all the industries, because they, if you even look at China, so what kind of Chinese innovations we're using? I mean, it's just, they are very good in just in, in copy pasting, They're maybe advancing something, but still the, the, the center of innovation is in the free world. Because only, only in the free world we can have people that can challenge the status quo, people that are with free minds that, uh, that don't care about taking the risk and failing. There's the, we know that there's the, um, there's a, there's a deciding, the, the decisive advantage of the uh, free market and, and our economy over central planning because we can accept failures. We can, just, uh, we can rely on people that are just willing to, to, to assume all this risk, while on the other side, they want to, to know the outcome in advance. But there's a way in which in the Cold War, and before that too with the fascists in, in Europe, the clarity of the contrast helped in some ways to mobilize the West. Yes. You know, you saw what the lack of freedom was, you saw what a gulag was, you saw uh, what genocide was, and you thought freedom, liberty, basic decency, self-government, rule of law really matters. You saw how communism worked, yeah. it didn't work, and you said, okay, markets really are fundamental. Now, as you say, in a way, the, the threat's more, uh, it's easier for, it's harder for people, in a way, to rally against, because it's more, the threat is more chaos, and. 
as you say, moral equivalence. Uncertainty, yes. On it's, Deca, yeah. Fake news yeah, fake and news. sort of, and, and, you know, they have markets sort of over there too. It's not like Putin doesn't, there's not private business in Russia or in China, obviously, and they have fake elections and it's, it, it is a different kind of, I guess, suppose in a way it's both, I don't know, it's more insidious challenge perhaps uh, in terms of the West. But it's, it's probably even more dangerous. Yeah, well, because it's not so obvious. That's why we, 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 we heard about hybrid wars. It's they know they're weak. They know they cannot challenge us directly as, as Stalin or Hitler did. Yeah. But they have so many ways of challenging us using our own institutions as, as vehicles to, to uh, interfere with, uh, with democratic process and also to poison our political, financial, uh, and, and social infrastructure. I mean, in that respect, I suppose the the Rome, the example of Rome, you know, falling ultimately is in a way maybe more relevant than the 30s. We're not, Rome didn't fall to some great alternative system, you know. It fell to internal corruption and erosion, a lot of attacks on the periphery, yes. a sense of loss of, of, of willpower, a loss of nerve, a lot of other issues, obviously, oversimplifying, oversimplifying hundreds of years of history here. But, I mean, I wonder if that if we, I mean, and we sort of are not maybe well set up or we, we're not conditioned to think about the challenges quite that way, you know? No, because I think it's, it's the, um, we have very short span of attention. It's this, this um, uh, the Twitter er era, so all these, these technologies. Let's not criticize Twitter too No, much. no, 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 it's, it's not criticizing <laughs> you, Twitter. I, I use it all I'm the time. I'm teasing you, yeah. No, I'm I, just, I know, the, yeah. no, but it's just, it's, the, it's, it's a very useful tool to actually to, to um, to measure the public reaction, so yeah. but again, it offers opportunity for the uh, for the other side yep. to uh, um, so create just fake news and just to fake trends, and also to uh, sort of create fake impressions of what public thinks right now. But you know, it's we pay too much attention to sort of news that are coming right now, and it's, we're losing the sight of you know uh, of strategic vision. So what is the uh, so what is the plan? So what, what we want to uh, achieve within the next 5, 10, 15 years? There's so many things that we, we can do because now we have seen the rise of AI in these new industries. By the way, coming again from America, from Canada, from Europe, it's not Russia or even China. So though China is just doing its, it's a very good job because they could see that Russia is just uh, is, uh, doing the dirty job and Putin is just you know, on the fire while China can benefit by just gradually uh, sort of building its strengths uh, uh, behind behind uh, Putin's uh, hybrid wars, um, but uh, it's time for us to think about the future. It's time for us to to um, to offer the vision because that's that's what what's what we're missing by trying to communicate this message to uh, our message to the youth, even in our in, in this country, even in Europe, and of course beyond the free world in Africa, in Asia. They have to hear that we have a vision of the future that just goes beyond, you know, a, a new iPhone or, or, or a new, new version of technology that, that allows us just to push, you know, uh, instead of pushing buttons, you know, this, uh, swapping our finger. So what about the space exploration? So what about the, the, it's the, what about the plans to, to move mankind just vertically, not horizontally, but just to, to new heights? We can do that, but it's, it's, it's about a vision that, that requires um, uh, the combination of, of the change of the public mood, uh, business community, but also political leadership. And so far, we, we could see that political leadership has been concentrating on a very short-term agenda. It's nobody wants to think beyond uh, two, two years term, four years term, uh, or just again, it's, 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 a, it's a one term in the office, and, and in the middle of this term, they're already thinking about re-elections. But in a way, it's worse, isn't it? Because the pol political forces that seem to be on the ascendancy in the West, not just in the U.S., are illiberal forces, uh, people who are critical of globalization, of liberal democracy, of boring, boring things like the rule of law. So in a way, it's, it's not just that we have short-term, we have politicians who think in a short-term way, or they're not quite as strategic as they should be. We actually have political forces rising that are illiberal and that's but, but that's that's yeah but that's 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 a part of the same of the same uh, um, conundrum because uh, uh, w here in this country a lot of people are concerned about Trump administration actually about Trump himself but I think we should go beyond we should look beyond Trump because the the the, the threat is as that that's the uh, the Trump phenomena will will um, push the pendulum too far to the left as we could see now uh, in in the UK 
that the Brexit uh, um, uh, frustration helped to, uh, to boost unreformed communist uh, terrorist sympathizer Jeremy Corbyn, who is right. just, I don't think he will win elections and he'll be the prime minister, but the very fact but he that- he could, he's one but, election away from But exactly, him, yeah. but the fact is that we have such an awful person, one election away from taking over Great Britain. Yeah. And I don't, I, 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 I now, even I'm scared to think about all the consequences. Yeah, it's a start. Someone who is yeah. this, you know, this Hamas apologist, uh, a Castro apologist, uh, communist sympathizer, someone who hates U.S. and who believes that the, the free world uh, had no rights to uh, use force, while others, he can all find excuses for all terrorists and, 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 and um, uh, their backers in Kremlin or in Iran. Uh, he could be in charge of the United Kingdom and its, its military and, and, and intelligence machines. It's just, it's mind boggling. But that's, that's a real threat. Uh, we could see that, the, that the, 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 the simultaneous rise of the far right and far left, even in France, we could yeah. see Le Pen, but also Mélenchon, who yeah. made almost the same, uh, uh, show the same result at the, at the um, first ballot or presidential um, election. So we, we could see in France that far right and far left made more than 40%. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's bad news. And Germany. And Germany, the coalition's and the, and, on, and but the, it loses, and, and it's the, lost a huge amount of the vote. Exactly. Yeah. So, it, and then we can look at other countries like Austria, that is just totally pro-Putin, Hungary, pro-Putin. We just look at the Eastern Europe, Central Europe, uh, Italy now, you know, I think I, I, I joked on Twitter that was the first election Putin, Putin won, uh, free and fair elections that Putin won. Right, right. Uh, and it's, 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 it's quite scary, but I think again, Europe is, is, is in this kind of political limbo because there's no leadership. It's, we can go back to 1946, and that was just, it's, it was a much bigger mess, but there was American leadership. Yeah, Unless no, America once, shows leadership, yeah. you cannot expect these problems to be resolved. Because it's the, in the modern world, if you walk away, and that's the mistake made by Obama, and that's this being, you know, now uh, echoed by Trump administration, you walk away, you don't solve problems. You create vacuum, and the vacuum will be immediately filled by other guys, and I can even name these guys, whether region, on, on the regional level or geopolitical level. I mean, even in '46, we pulled out as fast as we could after World War II was. But then, but then realized but then we qu came back. quickly. Churchill realized. gave the speech yes. in '46, yes. but it yes. was not well received here. Then we, with Stalin's threat and Greece and Turkey and so forth, we really did. But you still mobilize. Truman but still, deserves a lot of credit, and and both parties because the, the Republicans, though they had some isolation of strains, ended up supporting Truman and so forth. But uh, it does show the you do need a sense of threat, perhaps, to really mobilize. And there is a kind of weird combination of complacency and fatalism in the U.S. That, and certainly in Europe, I would say, uh, that I'm not sure which masks which, you know, is it, is it sort of the fatalism? People don't want to deal with the threat, so they pretend it isn't that great a threat, or they think it isn't that great yeah, a threat, the so they enemy, don't deal with it. But the enemy, enemy is just more of a chameleon now. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's not, it's not, to, it's not, you know, the, the, the uh, SS marching across Europe. Stalin, it's not yeah, Stalin yeah. Uh, just, uh, just uh, conquering neighboring countries. It's not, uh, 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 Jap Jap Japanese empire uh, um, sort of beating military drums, you know, and attacking China. It's the threats are different now, and it just it's and that makes makes them ever more dangerous yeah, because well, they are, they are, they make us weaker just from from within. And and from without too, but it's not as dramatic. They take a little bit of Ukraine, you know. It's not exactly. like uh, right. No, but it's it's, uh, it's 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 actually I think it's this even when we look outside, so like Syria, it still it has a psychological effect. Yes, we do much. that. We kill people. We use chemical weapons, and you said nothing. Oh no, no, no. You said a lot of things, but you did nothing. Fine. So we ne we make a next move. So it seems that this this over last ten years, I think it's this as um, from two thousand eight. Yeah. Uh, we we were on just you know we were on sliding scale. I think it's really true and really really worse. So let me ask you this. So this would be very helpful if you would answer this question. So I was giving a talk at an Ivy on a panel at an Ivy League school recently, and I was talking it was more about Trump and Amer domestic politics and how important the rule of law was and liberal democracy and how we didn't appreciate. I was arguing with some conservatives who were a little more forgiving or understanding of Trump. And I, I was saying it's a real threat if we go down this road towards a European type of conservatism, if we forget about the fundamentals of liberal democracy, markets, limited government, you know, whatever, uh, rule of law. And an intelligent, I gather, I talked with him afterwards, a young man, a student actually, a senior, 
uh, stood up and asked, he said, Mr. Crystal, I mean, let's be honest. We're bored with all this rule of law and liberal democracy. And, you know, it's nice, but that doesn't really get you up in the... I, that, that's not an existential reason to care about America or to care about politics. And the attraction, he said, of not Trump exactly, but of Trumpism, is that it's about more than just this kind of let's have a good process and a fair playing field and let people live their own lives. That's too boring. And I, and I, I tried to answer, but I don't think I, I'm not sure I gave a very convincing answer. Uh, I mean, so what is the answer to that? I mean, what is the sort of fundamental answer on whether you would give such a, because I do think that underlies a lot of what, I mean, the more serious aspects and the attraction of Trump, Trumpism, if you want to call it that, to, to more intelligent, to some intelligent people is more along those lines, you know? You know, for intelligent people, I recommend to read a few books. And maybe they have to start from reading Founding Fathers. You know, now I think that these debates they had in 18th century, can you imagine in, in, in 1787 and just in following by just other, by following, in the following years, all these debates when there's a form of the government, they, they were so prescient. So this is, they could actually see all the threats that not only American society, but the rest of the world faced throughout next two, two centuries by just going from, you know, just, you know, from one form of democracy to another. And every time, whether it was in France, in Germany, elsewhere, they try to walk away from this boring, uh, rule of law, right. just its uh, regulations, into this uh, more effective form of government. Or exciting, personal. No, it was very exciting. Case. No, no, Hitler was exciting. Yeah, no, no, that's exactly. true. No, he's very exciting. Yeah. And Germans were tired because they didn't see how this old-fashioned, boring, uh, it was a two-party system, but still they had some left, some right, so they couldn't offer solutions. And Hitler knew just how to make Germany great again. Right. Make Germany great again. That's... I don't know how it sounded German, but that's yeah, yeah. that's what Hitler has been saying. And Mussolini, he did it, yeah. yes, he did it great, you know, for a few years, and yeah. it ended up, in, we know, with what's happened in Germany in 1945. Uh, so um, it just doesn't work this way. So there's no, there's, there are no shortcuts. Yeah, I would love to find, you know, just his, so the the the, um, the most effective way of solving the problems. And I I believe that you know I'm intelligent enough to to uh, insist that I know better than many others. But at the end of the day, you know, it's just it's even I'm, you know, I feel that I'm just the right person to offer you all solutions. We go back to this good emperor, bad emperor. So this is, we, we walked away from that. So this is the, the, uh, the checks and balances created by founding fathers. That was the most effective institution that not only preserved democracy in this country, but made it the most successful country. America is the most successful country in the world, just not because, you know, that's they, they were, okay, Im immigrants, they, they, they showed up here, the strongest survived, but also because they agreed to play by the rules. From Mayflower to Founding Fathers, they have been working incessantly on creating rules that will prevent tyranny. Yes. Same could, could be said about the Great Britain. Yep. So it's, it's also very, it's, it's, uh, it was very successful because over centuries, it had these fights against tyranny or force of tyranny and tried to actually, it's all about limiting government's uh, um, power to, 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 to cause you harm. So when we look at the, at, at, at the most successful countries in the world, they all, they all follow the same old boring pattern. And any attempt, you know, you, you move to any continent, this is not about geography, this is not about the race, this is not about religion. At the end of the day, it's all about countries, um, or the society of, of the respective country to follow the procedures. You can look at, uh, at South America and you can see the difference between Chile and uh, Bolivia. They're bordering countries. Uh, you could see the difference between Colombia and Venezuela now. Right. You can go back to, uh, or just you know, go to another continent, to Asia. You could see the difference between South Korea and North Korea. It right. says South Koreans, same people. In 1953, brothers and sisters. You separate this country, uh, this country, and now you could see one that is ruled by by the, by the most brutal dictator in the world, and another one is so scrupulously following procedures that they recently impeached right. and imprisoned the president, and also imprisoned the head of the biggest corporation in the country. 
Now, do we want to be South Korea or North Korea? So it's for those who say China is such a big store of success. Yes, but there's a tiny piece of China called Taiwan with the same Chinese people living on a tiny island uh, with just rocky island, uh, not having the same resources as continental China. Do we want to be Taiwan or China? It's, it's just, you look at the map. Yeah. It's, and, and every time, you know, you just, you know, you, you, you compare uh, uh, the, those countries that follow this, the, the, uh, the old, uh, traditional, conservative, you mean, liberal, doesn't matter. The words are irrelevant. But the rule of law, the regulations that, that, that created the level playing field against those that tried to find shortcuts, the result was always the same. Yeah, well, that's a better answer than I, I gave, I think. I mean, I tried to... So I grew up in a communist country. So, so I, I said, said I, well, my I, answer... I are passionately for, that was for great. not it, making mistakes so that my answer was, on our side. My answer was talk to people who grew up in a communist country, and I think I mentioned you and other uh, famous uh, dissidents and people who wrote eloquently about this, and as sort of this is the path you think is just more exciting, more existentially thrilling, more daring, and this is where it ends up. It ends up in, in either in, in either a nightmare as in the German case, or, case, or at best in a very, dec you know, in a, in a dictatorship where the stifles, look, 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 the stifles look, look at creativity Venezuela. Look, but look at the and all the best Venez people want to Venezuela leave. Yeah. Look at Venezuela. So just it's the, it's, uh, the potentially the richest country uh, uh, in Latin America, and it's just, it's a nightmare. Yeah. No, and that's, but I, that's a good current example, because I, as I gave this answer, I realized I was also citing people who were had lived and written before this young man, this student was born in a different era that he probably thinks is, you know, the past that it doesn't hold anymore and the people that we read who had such an influence and the statesmen who had such an influence. And that is a real challenge, I think, for the West. You know, I, uh, Lincoln has that wonderful speech he gave when he was 29 years old in 1838 about, you know, the memories of the revolution, he says, are gone and we need to rebuild the foundations of respectful law out of reason because we don't have the kind of inspiring, you know, stories that fathers would tell their children about fighting the British and that kept the spirit of liberty alive. And I really feel that way today, that somehow the, you know, the spirit of, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, that there was a, it was easier for us to look but you're in, right, but you you're grew right. up hearing yeah. about World War II and appeasement and Hitler and the fascists and Stalin. Then you lived through a Cold War where you saw, you met people who had left the Soviet Union or who had bravely protested and were put in prison and others who had come over from Cuba and you really had a sense of what was at stake. And I, I just, it's hard. That has to be re somehow captured. But I think. also, I witnessed the resurrection of KGB rule in my country. That forced me to leave uh, Russia now to live here in New York in yeah. exile, uh, and that's 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 another lesson. Uh, it's, it's a hard lesson I learned. That is, evil doesn't die. Uh, it could be buried under the rubble of Berlin Wall for a while, but if we turn complacent, if we lose our vigilance, it sprouts out. And there is something in human beings that is attracted to that, right? I mean, there's a kind of temptation, you might say. Yeah, because right? evil, you know, there's the, there are many ways to lie, and there's only one way to, to tell the truth. And evil can um, wear different clothes. And it's, 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 it doesn't pre pre present itself as evil. So it is, it, there's so many ways now of misleading people, especially young people, because they... They, it's which, which is irony because- I'll talk about that can, since you do a lot with young people. Yeah, because it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's an irony because now they don't even have to, to, to buy the books. I mean, they just, just look at the, at the internet, just you know, <laughs> swipe their finger and just to, 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 to read every story. They can learn more in five minutes that you know, I, I, I could uh, um, uh, learn uh, 20 years ago, spending hour, hours right, or right. days even. Uh, and, but still, you know, I'm shocked when they talk about, for instance, Bernie Sanders and about socialism. What do you know about socialism? So it's, just, it's an amazing debate. So they, they, they think that it's just, it's the, it's, everything could be free. So they just, they just don't understand money doesn't grow on the trees. So it's the, and, and we just have to, you know, we just have to invest before we can demand benefits. You know, reaping benefits, you know, requires you just to, to, to plow and just <laughs> and to seed something right. before, before you can expect something in return. Um, and uh, um, I think it's, it's partially our fault because we just, we thought, oh, it's, if it's in the books, you know, if it's so obvious for us, it will be obvious for them. Ah, uh -uh, it's not obvious, you know. It seems to me that, again, it's like I keep, keep repeating this, the, the, uh, the Reagan's pressing words that uh, uh, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It's, this is the word that we have to do all the time, going back to Lincoln, that's what you said. So it's just, it's the, it's the, they need some, some sort of um, 
uh, memories that they, get, they can connect with. It's not just say, oh, Hitler, Stalin. For many of them, Soviet Union, you know, was as ancient as, as, as Troy. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> and it's very important that we'll, we'll actually find the, find the right words, find the right concepts, find the right framework to, to sell this history. And I think one of, one of the most powerful weapons is to talk about the future. So, so how talk the, about that, how I, the free I'm, world, I'm probably too backward but looking, how but the I, free world can make you feel better. That's why you know I'm, I'm a big um, uh, su uh, supporter of space exploration. We have to bring back the dream because when you when we hear these great speeches, you know, of, of, of from the past, uh, uh, from the leaders of the free world, it was all about dream. Yeah. So this, they 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 could motivate people. They can inspire people. They can fire them up because it's this you you. you Unless people are inspired, unless they are driven by the big idea, by the dream, they can be, you know, they can be easy prey for those who are offering the fake dreams. Yeah, I mean, people like me probably f focus too much on the, the threat of, which is true, I believe, that the, you do not want to go down the road of abandoning all the safeguards of liberal democracy and the rule of law and self-government and so forth. But it can't just be the threat. It has to also be the positive vision. On no, but it's, it's only positive vision because vision. if you, I mean, warning is just, you know, it's, it's a lot thing you want to do. It's just because it's, people are getting fed up, you know, warnings, warnings, you know, this is right. uh, warning signs, you cannot go there, you cannot. No, it's just, it's, you don't do that because if you do that, it will harm the dream. So this is, it's all about moving, moving forward. And that's, you go back to these, these great speeches. It's just, it's, and that's how the great leaders could, could I I inspire, um, uh, um, citizen of the free world to create miracles. Because at the end of the day, when just we had, you know, head-to-head -head fights, the free world that was slow, ineffective, and as many dictators believe, weak, right. demonstrated strengths. But we don't want just to, 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 uh, to wake up at, at, you know, at, at, at Pearl Harbor night. We don't want, you know, just to, uh, to wake up when Hitler takes over Poland. We, we, we would rather read books and, 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 bring, and bring the young generation just to, to our side by offering them great future, which is not guaranteed, but they'll have to work for that, but they should feel that we care about that. It's not only us uh, trying to live, to, to live on the laurels of our great predecessors. It's basically not uh, telling them, look, you know, we did everything and now just, you know, let's enjoy it. It's, uh, it's a consumer paradise and we can all live here. Mm. This is, if we, if we offer them nothing, then they will, they will be affected by Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Putin, mullahs, terrorists, because we know every generation has many passionate youngsters that are willing to change the world. Unless we channel the energy in the right direction, somebody else will do it uh, to harm us. Oh, that's very well said. So say a little more about, maybe just to close, about the right direction. I mean, you mentioned space, but I mean, how much of it do you think is a sort of technology? How much of it is sort of other aspects of freedom? Well, I mean, the, it seems to me... It's the, it's, you know, it's, when I say space, people say, oh, why should we waste so much money on Mars, you know, on Mars expedition? It's, we don't know what we'll find there. By the way, that's exactly the point. We don't know. That was the, the uh, uh, um, driving force behind pioneers in this right. country crossing, you know, just uh, Appalachians and moving westward without having a map. Um, but it's also, it's just this, uh, from history we know that the most important things, the most, the, 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 the most vital results always found in the process. We don't know what we'll find out by finding Mars, but I can bet you that maybe on one of the asteroids we'll find so it's a new uh, 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 substance that will replace oil. I don't know, but there's, there's some great things will happen, and it's very important that energy will be concentrated on exploration. Exploration is the, it was always the, the, um, uh, the key element of the success of the free world, and exploration is that's what makes the free world uh, um, much looking much more powerful than uh, than non-free world, because again, we can take risk. We rely on individuals. 
we give them chance to, to show themselves, while the unfree world always try to sort of secure results. So that's why they'll always be behind. They can compete as the Soviet Union did with America for a short period of time, but at the end of the day, we prevail. And that will motivate young people. That will give them hope that they will, they, they can also uh, um, uh, have their 12 labors. Uh, um, whether it's in, in, in deep oceans or in, 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 in open space, somewhere. But exploration and physical expansion, that, that, they're very important. Um, and that's how we, I think, will bring more and more young people to our side, because we'll show them that what we did in the past, the new technologies that they use now, um, they, can, they can actually build the foundation of the new world. So we are working with them, for them, uh, and uh, free world is still the best framework with these boring regulations, with the rule of law, with these democratic Election institutions. Right. These, those are just, you know, the, the, those are the framework, the, the, the right formulas of success. But it's for success for them to, 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 to achieve by just, you know, um, following the footsteps of uh, their forebears. Well, that was terrific. You should, uh, it's too bad you can't run for president. <laughs> that, that, uh, maybe someone, someone will watch this, will watch you, will... Someone who was born here and is a legitimate candidate. I just, we'll, I hope we'll that, I can, that we can inspire young people no, actually to, to become no, proactive. I, think, I do think that's a, I, I feel guilty of this. I think many people, you know, I'd say generally of my way of thinking, we're pretty good at explaining why you should not go down these terrible paths. I think we're pretty good at explaining the history maybe of liberal democracy and the political theory of it, but the forward looking vision, the excitement, the sense of uh, risk and challenge, that's probably something we've we don't do enough but of. That's the secret of success of the free world. That's why this country is so great. That's, that, that's why the free world always dominated uh, in the last uh, uh, 200 years, at any time when it confronted the un uh, unfree world. So it's, again, you play any game, you want to use your advantage. And you don't want to, to d downplay your advantages and to give chance for opponent to, to use your weakness. And they win a static game, but they don't win exactly, a absolute game. Exactly, that's absolutely. That's the moment you play a static game, you, uh, you give them chance to, uh, to ruin us. Okay, well, let's hope our leaders listen to you, play a dynamic game, defeat our enemies, and, uh, but really do mobilize the country on behalf of freedom and liberal democracy. That's so important. You're doing work in that area. We're all trying to do our yes. bit. And uh, we'll have that, continue that conversation yes, in the future. Yes, absolutely. Gary, thank so, you so thank much. You, thank you. Really, thank it's you. great. Uh, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.